Let me um, remind you again of uh, uh, the issue. So uh, we started out with uh, this benign looking um, uh, parabolic uh, nonlinear uh, PD driven by, let's say, white noise or something which uh, is of the same uh, type and structure. And uh, uh, the problem was that even for the linear equation, this thing is so rough that the solution uh, of any solution of the linear equation is not a function anymore. Uh, it's genuine distribution, so this doesn't make sense. So that was a very fundamental problem. And then uh, we said, OK, uh, let's regularize uh, the noise. But then I told you that this doesn't solve the problem because eventually, of course, you want to let the regularization go to 0 because you want to uncover some scaling invariance, which formally you have without the regularization. Uh, but if you just do this, then uh, uh, kind of the solutions blow up. The solution manifold uh, doesn't have a meaning in the limit. So then I told you the only way to uncover something in the limit is to change the problem by adding this uh, counter term. And while this looks a little bit arbitrary, we're kind of happy uh, that uh, uh, the counter term is simple, right? I mean, the, uh, the least we have to modify the equation, the better. The less we have to modify the equation, the better. And uh, while we could have you know, written many counter terms, this is the one the only one which survives under the symmetries in law of the noise. So these two things, in a certain sense, belong, belong together. So this is why I guess this is called a counter term. Then we realized that, that it was actually convenient to, uh, uh, or anyway, that's what we wanted to do. We wanted to look at the entire solution manifold. And in fact, it was convenient to even enlarge it and to say we want to solve this equation up to something extremely smooth. Uh, which is still uh, um, um, uh, uh, meaningful, or I mean, anyway, it's meaningful, but which still uh, uh, doesn't give you all functions because there is still a big difference, at least in the limit row going to zero, between this very rough thing and this very smooth thing. So uh, it's not like considering all possible right-hand sides, but right-hand sides which split into a very smooth part and a very rough part, so it's a kind of dichotomy. So that was, the, uh, that was the solution manifold. And then uh, we embarked on uh, kind of taking Malyavin derivatives. And uh, of course, you know, why not do it right away on the level of the nonlinear equation? And uh, then you get uh, uh, you would get. Uh, you would get this uh, uh, this equation, and uh, uh, oh, and I forgot uh, one term, of course, here plus del xi rho uh, plus analytic. So remember that I'm using I'm always being very you know I'm always very liberal with notation. Here, del really means that's an that's an element of the Cameron Martin space. Here, del means the operator, which means taking the directional uh, Malyavin derivative. So, uh, so you end up with this. So that at first looks much better because um, you've replaced the rough noise by something from the from the Cameron Martin space that's more regular. Uh, but that doesn't solve the problem because of this prefactor. This prefactor still contains the rough solutions. And in fact, uh, uh, we're, we still have this phi square, for instance. And it still has this counter term, which we think or which we know will blow up. So, uh, uh, so just using the Malyavin derivative doesn't solve the, uh, the problem as such. And, uh, and the, same, uh, the same thing comes up uh, uh, on the level of our uh, parametrization. Or rather, <clears throat> it comes up on the level of uh, uh, on the level of the coordinates, uh, on the level of the centered model, because uh, the analog of this equation is uh, is this one here, plus uh, analytic. 
And, uh, and last time we, uh, 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 we looked at uh, kind of uh, a couple of components. So uh, component-wise, uh, you, know, you, you can spell this out. So we looked at the uh, component zero for which uh, everything was fine. Del three for which we were kind of lucky that things were fine. And then uh, two del three uh, in which case we realized that's not good enough. So, uh, so the challenge really is, uh, is to give a, a robust sense to uh, uh, this, um, this definition of pi minus the right hand side, which uh, 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 was. Uh, defined like this because the second part, the linear equation, uh, that's never a problem. I mean, unfortunately, there is not, there's not much of a PDE audience here, uh, but it's quite common nowadays in PDE to, to split in your mind a nonlinear PDE into a, a, a linear differential equation and a nonlinear pointwise relation. So all this business of convex integration or so is based on, uh, on, this, uh, on this separation into a uh, into these two aspects. Of course, this is a plain rewriting of the, of the original problem. And the problem was really uh, here in this, uh, in this definition of pi minus in terms of pi. And, uh, and, and, uh, uh, and the problem was, uh, in a certain sense, in all terms, uh, or at least in these two terms, because uh, we still have a singular product, which doesn't make sense. We still have the, uh, uh, the counter term, which blows up, so we hope uh, uh, you know, we're hoping for cancellations between these two effects, but that shows that this is not a good representation because it contains two terms which in principle, uh, you know, should, which, which cancel to some extent and we should display this cancellation by a better, by a better representation. So, uh, and the claim was that we can do this on the level of the Malyavin derivative. And I'm always uh, looking at the directional Malyavin derivative. So I, I claim that uh, uh, we can define uh, uh, we can define something which is stable, something which is robust uh, uh, from uh, going from the Malyavin derivative of the model to the Malyavin derivative of the right-hand side, pi minus. And uh, there was this uh, kind of intermediate object, which I will remind you of, which allowed us to, uh, to define this robust, uh, robust mapping. And now let me, uh, let me uh, write this down again, how in a certain sense these two errors are defined. So um, d gamma star x is uniquely determined. So this is something we still have to show that it's unique um, by imposing that um, it provides a good local approximation of the Malyavin derivative of pi in the sense that if we apply it to uh, the centered model in some general base point x, uh, then uh, this expression uh, vanishes to an order uh, which is uh, larger than two uh, in this uh, kind of point x, which means that uh, if you take space-time derivatives of order n, of parabolic order n less or equal to 2, then these space-time derivatives vanish in this point x. Note that kind of the x is appearing in three places, right? So, uh, so the picture you should have in mind is uh, that uh, really uh, of, of a Taylor approximation. So here is time space R1 plus D in which uh, you have your general active variable. Here you have uh, your 
function del pi. So let's just look at, let's just think of one component. And uh, then you're looking at the point x, and you say that uh, at this point x, you can approximate it pretty well uh, by this object. And if you take another point x, you need to take another object, right? So that's really what this, uh, that's really the intuition of, uh, of this statement, right? And, but it's not, uh, it's like a Taylor series. So like a second order Taylor approximation. But it's not really because these things are not polynomials. You've enriched, you've enriched this uh, space of polynomials in a, in a way that's suitable for the problem that's intrinsic to this problem by exactly by what, uh, <clears throat> by all the work we did last week in constructing uh, the centered model. So now, now the point is uh, the work was not in vain. Um, uh, the things we constructed in particular because we constructed it for every base point is rich enough to describe interesting objects. For instance, the Malyavan derivative of the model itself. And uh, so, uh, so this is, so I still, I'm, I want, today I want to show you a little bit more details. I want to argue that uh, this condition here indeed determines this object in a unique way. And, um, uh, and, uh, but then once you have it, so this is still something we have to, uh, we have to show, uh, then uh, uh, the claim was that uh, you can recover uh, the pi minus by pretty much the same uh, type of expression, where here you have the pi, the Mayavan derivative pi minus, by uh, realizing that this vanishes. So uh, that's also something I want to show today. But that then clearly, you know, you can uh, see that this defines del pi minus at x in terms of del psi at x, uh, this object, and uh, pi x minus at x. So this is, that's pretty obvious that uh, uh, if that is true, we have the second leg uh, of this map. Other questions before I proceed giving you a bit more of the details of this, uh, this argument? Yes? Um, where does uh, last solution come from? Is the implication of the last one? Or? I'm sorry? Uh, is the last... Um, this one here? Yeah, yeah. That, that's, I, so, so what I want to... Uh, the two details which I want to give you now <laughs> is that this line uniquely determines this object, and that this line implies that. And that, I think, explains why, uh, why, why this is a well-defined map. Okay. Yes? Uh, do uh, the last one map to the derivatives require some regularity on the distribution or something? So, um, so in fact, I mean, of course, uh, in, in you know, the full-blown rigorous work, you have to show that uh, these objects are Malyavin differentiable, but that in the end is not so surprising because if you um, if you inspect the uh, kind of the hierarchical definition of pi of the pi betas in terms of xi, you realize that the pi betas are actually multilinear expressions in the noise, and therefore, in a certain sense, trivially Malyavin differentiable. That's not completely correct. That would be correct if we were working in a periodic context, uh, since we're working on the whole space because of the scaling invariances. Um, it's a slightly more complicated. Uh, uh, these objects are really stochastically defined, and you have to give a, an argument that indeed they are Malyavin differentiable. But that's a that's a technical that's a technical issue. So here, in uh, uh, in what I'm telling you now, I always. Uh, um, I always do as if uh, these things were clear. More questions? Yes? If this hypothesis, if this assumption is not true, is this able to find some, uh, some solution for the transition line? Which, which hypothesis?
it's not an hypothesis. I, I wouldn't call it a hypothesis. It's, um, it's the condition by which this thing is determined. So, um, so you should um, you should really think of this as um, as an um, as something analogous to uh, um, uh, uh, to the Taylor polynomial. So you're asking you you're given a function, and you you uh, you determine the polynomial, uh, which depends on the space point x, which has the property that the difference between the function and the polynomial vanishes to a certain order. And in Taylor, it's, you know, it's so trivial that we never think about it. Uh, if uh, we say that uh, the difference vanishes uh, to second order, then we know that this uniquely determines a polynomial of second order. But now the difference, the important conceptual difference is that we don't restrict, we cannot, because we're in the rough setting, we cannot restrict ourselves to polynomials here. But in a, in a certain sense, it's the same spirit. So here we have monomials, or generalizations of monomials, and here we have the coefficients. So I wouldn't call this a hypothesis. I would say uh, that this is the line which defines the coefficients of these generalized polynomials. More questions? Yes? What, what space this is in? So, uh, so, uh, so pi was uh, a random, uh, was, um, <clears throat> was a formal power series in these variables with coefficients which are uh, random space-time functions. And uh, uh, you can take a Malia van derivative of a ra random space-time function, a directional Malia van derivative of a random space-time function that renders a random space-time function. So delx pi is in the same space. More questions? Yeah. Of? Big pi. Big pi x was constructed like pi, but with the origin with the zero, with the origin at the zero replaced by the origin as a general base point x. Now, remember that uh, last week I told you, I, I solved this more as a kind of, in a completely geometric way, that there was no canonical, there was not a single canonical parametrization of the solution manifold, but there was only a canonical, um, a canonical parametrization of the solution manifold once you kind of agreed on a base point x, and uh, therefore we don't just get a pi, but we get a pi x. For every x we get a pi, we get a pi x. But now that actually turns into our favor, because we need the pi x here. More questions? Okay, so, uh, so now to show you a little bit the, uh, the spirit of, uh, of, the, of the type of arguments, which in the end are pretty uh, almost, I mean, for the most part, or for large part, uh, algebraic. Let me show you how, to, uh, how this uh, follows. Yes. Pi is the, the, the pi without x means that is the pi with origin at zero. If I don't put an index, it's always zero. That's my light notation, right? So uh, uh, pi is pi for x equal to zero. Okay. So uh, let's start with. Uh, um, with this, so uh, so uh, the claim is uh, is that um, so what I have to show is that uh, um, d gamma x star is uniquely determined, or is what well, I mean, that's is determined. 
by, by specifying how it acts on these things for all spatial space-time multi-indices of order at most two, right? Because uh, I want to, you know, I'm, I'm giving myself the del pi, so this is something I know. Of course, then I also know its derivative. Of course, then I also know its value at some point x. So this part is known. So the question is, uh, can I extract the information on this object from knowing this, right? So for, uh, for this uh, statement, that's exactly what I have to convince myself of. And uh, so that clearly requires that this has to be rich enough, right? And so, uh, and this is, you know, something which uh, sits in that space has to be rich enough. Right? If, if all these things were zero, then certainly we cannot draw any information out of it. So we, have, we need this to be rich, kind of substantial, not, un, I mean, not impoverished. And, uh, and in fact, this follows from something which uh, I will argue in a second. This follows from the fact that this here minus Zn is something which is in a smaller, in a subalgebra, and the subalgebra is spanned uh, is spanned by uh, finitely many variables, always the Z3 variable, but then only finitely many of these Zm variables, namely those which have a space-time index m, which is strictly smaller than the given index n. So, and then uh, I claim that, uh, um, I claim that uh, uh, together with our property that uh, d gamma star x pi pi prime is equal to d gamma x star pi gamma x star pi prime plus gamma x star uh, pi times d. So this kind of generalized Leibniz rule. Uh, so this and uh, d gamma star x of 1 and d gamma star x of z3 is equal to 0. I claim that uh, together with this, uh, that shows that here. star was the statement. What do you want to see first? Uh, the argument for this or how to go from here to there? Who wants to see this first? Who wants to see that first? There's a couple of more there. Okay. So, uh, so why, why, do you, why do you go from here to here? Okay. So, uh, so that you, uh, in a certain sense, you argue by induction in the uh, length of n. I can do it over here. So, how do we do this? Um, so, what, what we need to show is uh, uh, we need to identify uh, d gamma star x, how it acts on Zn for all n less than 2. Why is that the case? Uh, that is the case because we have these properties and in addition we know that uh, by our construction, remember that the ansatz for uh, d gamma x star was that this is a sum over space-time multi-indices of length 2, some coefficient which I call d pi nx, 
uh, gamma x star del z n. That was the ansatz, which we, in a certain sense, can completely forget, provided we retain these algebraic properties and uh, another one, which tells me that this is equal to zero for all n, which are larger than two because those will be killed by this operator. <coughs> Okay, so now once I wrote this down, you can in a certain sense forget about the ansatz and just think in, uh, in these terms. So the first thing to realize is that because of this multiplicativity, because of this Leibniz type rule, uh, it's enough to identify this object on the coordinates. Because if I want to identify it on any other monomial, I can use these rules and you know, split up the monomial. So for instance, you know, uh, so uh, if, we want to, uh, uh, if we want to know what this is, then what do we do? We uh, write this here as z3 gamma 3 uh, times uh, z0 gamma bold phase 0 times set uh, E1, gamma bold phase E1. So let me write this more efficiently. Uh, product over N, Zn, gamma bold phase N. And then by these rules, I can kind of split up this product and let uh, eventually let this object just act on every coordinate. And therefore, this object, so... Uh, this object is just determined by how it acts on the coordinates, right? That's, uh, that's, uh, that's the first, uh, first realization. Of course, I need to know the gamma x star itself, but this is something I'm happy to invest. And, uh, okay, uh, so, but then there are infinitely many coordinates, but most of them I don't have to consider. I don't have to consider Z3 because there it vanishes, and I don't have to consider Zn for large n. So all I need to do is really to identify uh, these finite expressions, right? n, so what are the possibilities for n? n can be, uh, can be equal to 0. Uh, it can be equal to, uh, um, so what are the cases? Uh, n is equal to 0. n is equal to ei for i going from 0 to d, and n is equal to ei uh, plus uh, ej for ij going from 1 to d. Those are kind of the four possible, or the three possible, or uh, to be precise, uh, yeah, I mean, it's more than uh, three, but uh, the three classes of uh, coefficients. So all I need to know is to, I have to, all I need to do is I have to understand uh, these finitely many cases. Okay, so uh, let's do that, you know, in a certain sense by induction. And let's start with uh, uh, n equal to zero. So step by step or inductively. And in fact, the, the right thing is to do an induction in the length of n. So for this one, the length of n is equal to zero. Uh, the length of n uh, is equal to one if I take uh, out... Uh, the zero and uh, the length of n is equal to two for these things. You know, remember there's always this little parabolic uh, headache that uh, the time-like variable is different from the space-like variables because this is two times n zero plus j one to d and j. So the right way to do that is to do an induction in n. So the base case is d gamma x star on z0. OK, then uh, we look at this line, and we use this line for n equal to 0. So use um, uh, this for n equal to 0, which means uh, pi x at x minus z0 
is something which is in this subalgebra. So uh, just spanned by, uh, by the variable Z3. And uh, now we apply D gamma X star to it. But d gamma x star annihilates this entire subalgebra because uh, of this property here, which is in certain sense built into the definition. So this is equal to zero. But this means that this uh, object is nothing else than that object, and that's exactly what I uh, what we allowed ourselves to know. So uh, so we're fine here. So let's look uh, at, uh, let's not do a complete induction, but let's look at the, just the next step. So anyway, it's just a finite, finitely many steps. So let's look at uh, uh, d gamma uh, x star applied to z e1. So let's take one of those here. So what is this? How do we have access to this information? Well, we again use this here now for n equal to e1. And then we get d gamma x star. Uh, so that, that turns into uh, um, del 1 of pi xx minus z e1 is equal is in the subalgebra which is spanned by c3 and z0 right uh, for uh, for for the specific case we look considering now this is e this is equal to 1 the length is equal to 1 so here i'm looking at all m's which have length equal to 0 that just leaves the 0 m so that's uh, what i get so now I apply my uh, endomorphism to this. Uh, and I get uh, uh, this here is in, it, in uh, something uh, working on that. But uh, now, I can, so this is something which I want to invest. So this is something which I, where, where I say I know this. Uh, this is what I want to know. But this is something I know already because anyway, uh, uh, I know what this, how this thing acts on Z3. It's zero. I just found out how it acts on Z0 by this argument. And by the algebraic property, if I know how it acts on Z3 and Z0, I know how it acts on any monomial. So this one's known by the previous steps. So by induction hypothesis. And uh, so this is how I get this. And now, I mean, I, I think you can see that this, uh, you know, I can also go to, uh, to all the other uh, uh, space-time indices n uh, with the same argument. So, uh, so now it's clear how to, uh, sorry, how to go from, uh, uh, from this to, uh, to star. So uh, that was the argument of how to go from here to here. So now I have to convince you of this triangular structure. Um, and that follows from, uh, from the way we constructed the model. Uh, what am I going to? Well, eventually I will write this down again because it's important. So I will get rid of it right now.
Um, so how to uh, how to give the argument for this? Um, so remember that we had this postulate. that uh, we said if we were looking at the uh, beta component of our model, we were mollifying on a scale r uh, or averaging around the origin on a scale r, then uh, this should have a, a certain behavior in the sense that the limb soup, if r goes to zero, should be uh, finite. And in fact, we proved something, I mean, the, the main theorem establishes this in a kind of, not in this qualitative, but in a completely quantitative way, where you're allowed to consider at any moment. And so what does that, uh, so first of all, by, you know, by this invariance in law, I can put, uh, I can put uh, an x here, provided I put an x there. So let's do this. And uh, uh, since for positive rho everything is smooth, what this really means is pi x beta is smooth. This means almost surely that pi, uh, x beta x is equal to zero for uh, n less than the homogeneity of beta, right? I mean, this, this was, in a certain sense, a certain uh, uh, order of vanishing of uh, the model component in the base point, which was given by the homogeneity of beta. So that is uh, kind of the algebraic translation of this, uh, the, the even more qualitative translation of this property. And now we want to, uh, we want to use this since, you know, we have something similar here. So uh, in order to go on, we have to understand the case of equality. So if the length of my space-time multi-index is equal to the homogeneity of beta, uh, then in particular, we know that uh, beta is an integer, that the homogeneity of beta is an integer. And we also know that beta is populated. Uh, meaning in particular that this uh, uh, square bracket of beta is larger than minus one. And this uh, was something we already used in f before in the context of Liouville. This means that beta must be of the form del m for some space-time index m. So, uh, so this special case implies that uh, beta has to be of this special form, in which case we also know that our model is of a special form. So if uh, um, we, have, um, uh, we have this uh, these indices, uh, we kind of build into the definition of our model that the model in this case is nothing else than a standard monomial. Uh, so therefore, if now you take the nth partial derivative of this guy and you evaluate it in x, you figure out that this is equal to 1 if these two space-time multi-indices are ident identical and equal to 0 else. And uh, so now combining these two things, you realize that uh, del n pi x beta x is equal to Kronecker of beta uh, del n for in this, uh, including the borderline case when the two lengths are equal. So, uh, so that's already, you know, going in a certain sense in this direction, because what I wrote down here, uh, 
of course, is nothing else than dn pi x minus zn beta. It's the beta component of this expression. So I already showed that the beta, of, beta component of this expression is, uh, is zero quite often. Uh, I already showed that the, that the beta component of this, uh, this exponent is zero quite often. It's only non-zero if uh, the homogeneity of beta is large. So I have to understand what this means. So recall that the homogeneity of beta was defined like this. Uh, uh, the homogeneity of beta minus alpha is equal to 2 times s beta 3 plus the sum over n beta n, uh, the length of n minus alpha. And uh, from this here, you easily see that, because um, I can raise this over there, you easily see that Uh, so, so it re remains to realize uh, that if uh, beta is such, if uh, multi-index beta is such that its length is larger than some natural number, which I write like this, so let me just call it k, then uh, then um, uh, beta of m is equal to zero for m uh, larger or equal to k. And that's exactly what we need because we want to argue that the, uh, that the remainder uh, the non-zero part lies in the space and is spanned by coordinates uh, which have an index which is strictly less than what plays the role of k. So, uh, so that proves this part. Now all this is in detail in the nodes. All this is not ex very inspiring. These proofs are you know, little, algebra little algebraic or combinatorial lemmas. So therefore, I stress so much the intuition and the geometry behind it, because when, when, it, when, it, when it boils down to the proofs, it, you know, you see in the end, it's, uh, you know, it's, you know, typically it's some kind of triangular structure like here. So it's always, in a certain sense, a triangular or a strict triangular structure. In combination with some induction argument. So this is, in fact, how most of the proofs boil down. And uh, it's not very, uh, so the details of the proof are, uh, are a little bit mechanical. And that shows you that, in a certain sense, the setup is correct. Uh, that once then you implement it, you could almost do it by a computer-assisted proof. OK, so uh, why did we do that? Uh, because I wanted to convince you that uh, uh, that uh, let's go back to uh, to the bigger picture. So uh, uh, I'm in the process of convincing you uh, that I that one can define in an unambiguous way this map. And now this part is uh, this part is done, right? That's uh, that follows from from these arguments. Uh, uh, these uh, Gubinelli derivatives, uh, these coefficients in a generalized Taylor expansion, this model distribution, just to kind of throw with a couple of names to which this object relates to, uh, they're determined by uh, the Malyavan derivative. And that's in the end kind of a completely algebraic argument based on our kind of systematic setup. So now I have to convince you of this one here. Uh, so uh, that means uh, I have to uh, I 
I have to tell you uh, I have to tell you that the following uh, formula is true, which I already wrote down. So del pi minus minus del xi one minus d gamma x star pi x minus at x is equal to zero, right? That's, uh, that's what I need to show because that determines del pi minus in terms of, of things which I already know. Of course, I know the uh, element of the Cameron Martin space. I know the model itself or the negative part of the model. I just argued that uh, I know this. Uh, so this formula does it for me, right? So if I, if I can convince myself that this formula is correct, uh, then uh, then I'm fine here, and uh, therefore I've constructed this. Uh, I've constructed this map. So again, why is this? Uh, this is correct. This is again one of these kind of little arguments. So the starting point is uh, the starting point is uh, how we defined this thing here. Of course, it's not surprising that this should play a role. But in fact, uh, uh, we needed this full information only to make this thing unique. And in order to go from here to here, uh, taking it for granted that this thing is unique, we actually just need that, which is you know, less information. Uh, that should make you suspicious. But again, uh, we use the full information to put a check under this thing. So, now it's again a completely algebraic statement. I have to convince you how to go from one formula, from one identity to another identity. Okay, so uh, how does this work? Uh, uh, in order to do it correctly, let me, well, I think I didn't even write it down carefully. So uh, let's, uh, let's do it in, uh, in real time. Um, what, uh, what, what are the ingredients? So, ingredients are um, the fact that um, um, well, let me look it up nevertheless. Right. So, and uh, of course, I should always put the row here. I sometimes forget it. Um, so I claim that uh, uh, it's enough to show the following. that del pi minus is equal to d gamma x star pi x minus plus del xi rho times one at x. Let's see, uh, why well, that's just in a sense, in a stupid reformulation what I wrote down. And, uh, and what we have is that uh, we have this here at x. And now, in order to pass from here to here, uh, I claim that uh, in view of, let me copy it somewhat mechanically, and then let's look at it together. Pi x minus is equal to set three pi x cube plus c pi x plus psi rho times one and del pi minus is equal to 3z3 plus c del pi plus del xi 
rho times 1. It's enough to show uh, the following identity. enough to show the following identity, namely that d gamma uh, x star applied to z3 pi x3 plus c times pi x plus this is equal to 3, uh, uh, there's no z3 pi square plus c times d x star pi x. And, uh, and then I claim once we know this, then everything is fine. So why is that the case? Uh, uh, so I want to show this. Uh, so I first plug in this, uh, that's, you know, just the definition of pi minus in the case of a general base point. So I plug this in here. Uh, then I'm here. And, uh, um, and then I want to show that uh, uh, this is equal to uh, uh, this thing over there. So once I have that this is equal to this thing over there, I can plug this in and uh, del pi minus, right, I can, plug, I can plug this in and uh, then I can appeal to this equation to see that indeed I get the left hand side. Okay, so that was a bit weird. So what is the, uh, what is the, uh, uh, what is the direction to go through? So you start from the left-hand side, then you glance at this, you replace the left-hand side by this expression, uh, or you put this on the other side, row one. Uh, so you glance at this expression, uh, that tells you that uh, you have to look here, uh, you have to look here, right, uh, you have to look here, and perhaps I'm doing something too quickly here. Perhaps I shouldn't look too much at my thing because now everything should be there. Okay, so uh, uh, so let's do it. Uh, so d pi minus minus del psi times one. Uh, now I look at this here. That tells me that this is 3 times z3. I must have forgotten something, pi square. 3 times z3 pi square, and probably I'm also forgetting it here, pi square plus c uh, times del pi. So this is, uh, this is using 1. Uh, now I'm using 2, to get 3z3 three three pi square plus c times d gamma x star del pi. Now I'm using 3 to see that this is d gamma x star z3 pi x3 plus c pi x plus c rho times 1. And now hopefully I'm using 4 uh, to see that this is equal to d gamma x star pi x minus. And uh, 
Right, and I have to keep in mind that uh, some of these identities only hold at the point x, so I should uh, write at x here. And this is, do I have a three? Yes, this is three, and this is four. So uh, indeed, uh, uh, one, two, three, four gives five. Okay, so that means uh, I have to tell you why this is true. One is uh, one we already had on the blackboard. That's just the m taking the Malyavin derivative of the definition of pi minus. So that's clear. This one was just the definition of pi minus, but at some, some general base point. That's clear. And now the only thing uh, I have to look a little bit more carefully is this one here. So let me write it down in a cleaner fashion. Okay, so why is that true? So let's do this over here. Uh, why is that true? Uh, well, uh, what I should use are the, again, the algebraic rules of this object here. So, d gamma x star applied to uh, this somewhat complicated looking term. What do I get? Uh, let's start from the last part. Uh, this is just a scalar. So this, uh, you know, as always, this sh these are objects in, uh, in, these are identities in this space. And in this space, this is just a scalar. That's just an element of X, if you want. Uh, so this thing pulls over the scalar and ends up being on the one, and on the one it vanishes. So this term leads to nothing. So now here this is more complex because this thing here is not just a scalar, it's an element of this space. And this is an element of the big space. So now here we have to use our generalized Leibniz rule uh, on, for products. So let me write it once down once more. So you apply this operator to the first factor and apply gamma star to the second factor, plus vice versa. So if uh, this operator falls on C, it's again zero because this operator annihilates Z3, and this is in the algebra generated by Z3. So uh, the first term, in a certain sense, is gone, and we just have to look at the second term, and the second term gives you uh, This one here, which hopefully we see here. And now the most interesting term is the first term because that's a product of four things. But then, of course, you know that if here I would put four things, I would get four terms, each uh, consisting of the product of four factors, uh, where you distribute the derivative-like uh, uh, quantity always on one and the uh, multiplicative quantity on the rest. And, uh, and therefore, by plain combinatorics or the Leibniz rule in an abstract way, you find that, uh, again, the derivative of this thing vanishes, and you're just left with the derivative of this because of the power of 3. You get the combinatorial factor of 3, and uh, you get this term. So, uh, so that's, the, that's the proof, right? And that's really like how most of the proofs are. They're extremely clean but boring because it's, in the end, uh, always uh, these types of... Uh, these types of algebraic, mostly algebraic arguments. Okay, so uh, so that um, that was the argument why uh, indeed we now have defined a map from del pi to del pi minus, which does not encode, which does not include uh, C.
and it is this representation that we'll uh, use for the estimate. Right, so, uh, so now, in a sense, and I can claim uh, in this conceptual, heuristic, informal section, I can claim success because we found a way of defining the kind of, of hiding the nonlinearity, of hiding this uh, uh, this uh, uh, this bad definition. Of hiding this bad definition into something that does no longer contain C and that does no longer, at least at first sight, contain a singular product. Right? So that's, that's exactly, uh, that is, uh, again, I'm, I'm, I keep stressing this, that this is really the main idea. And Malyavin derivative, derivative with respect to the noise, is used in this conceptual way of kind of finding this, uh, finding or identifying this relationship. Okay, so now I can do, uh, we can do two things. Um, the next section would be, um, the next section which I, um, yes? Yeah, that's correct. But, but, uh, but now we found a, a, a definition, a kind of, an, in a certain sense, an almost equivalent definition, which does not involve the constant C. Yeah, yeah, but, uh, but uh, uh, that's true. But, uh, but in the end, um, we, we uh, so, so looking at the Malyavin derivative of random variable captures the entire random variable up to its expectation. Yeah? So uh, we're, we're, we're disregarding a certain component of the random variable, namely its expectation. So we just look at the fluctuations. And on the level of the fluctuations of the random variable, we found a completely equivalent relationship which does not involve the C. I'm sorry? So, 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 I mean, <clears throat> I can write it, I can write the, uh, the implicit definition of this map uh, down again. Uh, so this was one part and the second part was, uh, uh, was what I raised. Del pi minus d gamma star x pi x del n x is equal to zero for all n less or equal to two. This relation defines the map from uh, del pi to d gamma star x and this defines d gamma star x to uh, del pi minus. Do you see a C? No. Okay. <laughs> That's the point. That's exactly the point. You, you, you've re-expressed the information. You've re so, so in a certain sense, it's the same. It's almost the same information as this one, but you've re-expressed it in a better way. And of course, you didn't re you, I mean, you didn't really rephrase it completely because you applied your loss operator, so to say, by just looking at the fluctuations, right? So, so you said, let's look at the fluctuations because the expectation anyway is taken care of by the BPHZ renormalization postulate. So therefore, let's agree that the main thing is to understand is the fluctuations. And then this is exactly the, the thing that on the level of the fluctuations, uh, we found <clears throat> a robust relationship which does not involve the C. Yeah, so that's, but I, I think that's really the, the key part of everything. And, 
and again, I like to stress that you get it from this geometrical point of view of thinking of uh, manifolds and tangent spaces. Okay, now, so that you have, an, in order to, for you to have a choice, uh, we can say I either continue to answer your questions or uh, I, uh, I prove something, uh, I give you another glimpse of how proofs look like uh, by showing Uh, by showing uh, what would be the next section, which I'm always bad at numbering. Eight, if I'm not mistaken. Section eight, uh, which is about the population of this interesting object D, gamma star X, and its strict triangularity. and uh, ultimately the order of induction. And uh, instead of writing this down, I remind you of something from the first chapter, uh, which I never really, because of lack of time, spelled out, uh, which was 18, uh, which was the population uh, of uh, gamma star X and its strict triangularity. And uh, there the claim was uh, the following. So there is a twofold claim. So um, uh, we look at this uh, change of baseball transformation and we look at, the, at its matrix representation, so the entries in this infinite, uh, in this matrix, in this square matrix uh, with inf infinitely many rows and columns as parameterized by the multi-indices. So we claim that uh, if gamma is populated, and let me recall the notation gamma is populated, if uh, morally speaking uh, this object is not identically equal to zero, and algebraically, that meant either gamma is purely polynomial or this thing is non-negative. I can remind you of the definition in a second. So if gamma is populated, then this here is equal to zero unless uh, beta is populated. Uh, that was the first. That's the first statement. The second statement is uh, for any gamma, And this is something we already used. This thing minus the identity, beta gamma is equal to zero unless the homogeneity of beta is strictly less than the homogeneity of, the homogeneity of gamma is strictly less than the homogeneity of beta. And this is what I call strictly triangular. The picture you should have in mind is, uh, uh, you know, here you have the, gamma components, here you have the beta components, you have ones on the diagonal, you have something here, but nothing here, right? So that's, uh, that's, uh, that's the picture you should have in mind, and this is why I call it strictly triangular, and it means that this uh, uh, endomorphism is invertible. So in particular, this thing as endomorphism on our infinite dimensional space of power series in these dummy variables is invertible. In fact, they form a group and that leads to uh, the notion of higher structure group. But uh, in the notes or in this course, anyway, this course is almost over. Uh, we don't really need that uh, group structure, but it's a very interesting algebraic thing, and there's, you know, there's quite a bit of work also on these purely algebraic uh, aspects. Okay, so now here comes the choice. Uh, I can start proving this by induction in beta, 
then you get a little bit the flavor of how these things work, but they're boring and they're in the notes. Or I can take your questions. So if I don't get questions, of course, I will start proving this. Yes? So, in, in principle, I explained it. I mean, I'm, I'm not planning to give you a kind of an introduction into the technicalities of Malievin calculus. And the way you should see is really the intuition you should have is the one which I gave, that the del psi is an element of the Cameron Martin space. And you're taking derivatives, you're in a certain sense taking derivatives in direction of del psi. And, um, uh, and you're monitoring these directional derivatives of the random variables you're interested in. And what I might tell you tomorrow is how to use that in an estimate in conjunction with a spectral gap assumption. But I will not certainly not, I don't have the time to talk, you know, to tell you about cylinder functions and closedness of operators and uh, uh, to properly define the Malyavan derivative. That uh, I think is in textbooks. Okay. So I'm, I'm, when it comes to Malyavan derivatives, I'm just a user, and I stress the fact that uh, the usage is a little bit unconventional, in the not in the sense that it's not rigorous, but we don't use it to prove kind of that densities are being smooth, but we use it very much like we used it in the case of stochastic homogenization, namely in order to get estimates of moments of random variables. More questions? Yes. Yeah. The first one uh, has uh, pi minus and there's some C inside, so it's not desirable. And that, that's why you want to obtain the lower one, which uh, what you want to obtain? No. So, 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 uh, so what's not, what is not desirable is uh, this, um, this formula here. That is the form, that's the, that, that was our original definition of pi minus. That is not desirable. Why is it not desirable? Because it contains this infinite constant and it contains this singular product. So we don't want to use this. So we, we're, we look for a different way of relating pi to pi minus. And the way we do it is by relating the Malyavin derivative of pi to the Malyavin derivative of pi minus. And this relationship between the Malyavin derivative of pi and the Malyavin derivative of pi minus is not direct, but it's hidden in these two lines. So I split this map from del pi to del pi minus. So this here defines a map from pi to pi minus. I'm not happy with this map. I can't use it. It's not stable. It's not robust. So I want to define a new map. Uh, no, I want to give a, uh, I, in a certain sense, I want to find the definition of this. I don't want to change things, right? I'm, I'm not changing things. I changed things in the beginning, but now I don't change things. So I want to give a different interpretation of this map, or I want to give a more robust interpretation of this map on the level of what it means for the Malyavan derivatives. And that's contained in these two things. So I'm defining this map by first going from del pi to d gamma x star, and then going there. And this map is defined by this first line, and this map is defined by the second line. This is more obvious because in a certain sense what I'm doing here, if I rearrange it, uh, I just say del pi minus of x is something, and the something is this. Uh, whereas the, the definition of the first map is a little bit more implicit, and has to do with the argument which I gave before, that this thing here uniquely determines these coefficients. by some pi 1. What do you mean by pi 1? Pi 1. Uh, pi 1, I mean you have so del pi. Yeah. In a second, can you do something with pi, 
del uh, del pi y replace zero by some uh, some other point y. So so here uh, here it is so 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 in this formula it's very important that uh, uh, I'm looking at it in a situation where the base point this is what I call kind of this generalized base point agrees with the active variable. If I put you know something different here y then I could never satisfy this because then I would be saying that this function agrees with this function. I mean, I mean, uh, okay, so why is keep that, but the del pi, I mean, we replace that pi by some pi y. Is that a pi zero? Here, this is always for x equal, when I don't write an index, uh, so, uh, so that's something which, uh, which I said before. If, uh, if the pi or the del pi or the del, del pi minus does not have an index, what I mean is this thing at x equal to zero. Yes, uh, yes I agree that, but can we uh, replace x equal to zero by some? Sure, by stationarity. So I can always, I can always say without, of, without loss of generality, instead of having to be interested in uh, this object, uh, I can say, without loss of generality, I set this equal to zero, right? But the interesting thing is, even if, uh, you know, I set this equal to zero, here I need the full generality. Yeah, yeah. yeah? More questions? I'm just sorry, but the, uh, the important point is, so the three x, they are not uh, zero on the part. Yes, here, here is, uh, here is, so, so, uh, so the, remember that the, uh, the pi has, um, the pi has, you know, potentially uh, two, multi, uh, two indices, right? There is uh, the base point, which might be equal to zero, and there is the coefficient, I mean, the component, which is beta. Here, uh, in this line, I suppress the, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm using, because otherwise you get lost in indices, I'm using compact notation. What this really means is I'm looking at, uh, kind of every component, and here I would uh, put the matrix elements. So that's what it, that's what it means. Now, uh, now I'm down to a, to a function. Yeah. yeah, and here, so here is, if you want x equal to zero, beta, here is, uh, here is a general x gamma. So it really, it really relates, uh, if you want, it relates, uh, uh, d pi for general x, now let me call this uh, x, and beta is related to pi z and gamma. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah? So I need the entire, I need all the, so, so, so all these objects which I introduced last, last week, I do need them to kind of write down this identity. Yes, thanks. Are there some other questions? Yes, Sifika. Can you repeat again because there was some noise outside? So the middle step when we are going from a del derivative of pi to pi minus, the middle step is d gamma. So here? Yes. Yeah. Yes, that, that step is needed because of the dependence on the parametrization or like uh, is there a model that we can go directly or this is really required? I think this is this is uh, um, this is required. I mean uh, um, so, so the, the parametrization, in the end, the everything, I mean, so this entire approach is, I mean, you have this vision of your solution manifold and uh, you're taking the Malia-Van derivatives there, but in the end, what you do is you work in a term-by-term -term fashion on the level of the pies. <laughs> that's, the, that's the level on which you can carry things out rigorously, and uh, that requires I mean, I, derive, I motivated these pi's by saying that they are the coefficients in uh, the parametrization of the solution manifold. So I, the, 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 the pi's are hardwired in this, uh, you know, even, you know, if you look in the physics papers, they have something which also corresponds to the pi's. There it's indexed in a different way, but they have similar objects. So that's, that, this, this type of parametrization 
seems, uh, seems unavoidable, but I'm not sure whether I answered your question. Okay, I mean there are many. So, so, so let me write it down in, in, in kind of in the uh, in the simple form again. In the more no, in, in the more compact form. So this piece of information. Remember that uh, this was uh, just um, this is hiding a regularity result which I wrote down at first. Uh, which was saying, now let's look, this, let's look at this object, uh, let's say a component, but I'm suppressing this. Let's look at this object here as a space-time function. In fact, it, it's rather in the limited distribution. So let's convolve it, let's mollify it around the point x. Then uh, what's behind this here was the statement that this here is big O of 2 plus s. And in fact, uh, what's behind that one is a real estimate, which you know, I can uh, uh, state more precisely, or I can talk a bit more next time, of uh, any algebraic moment of uh, this quantity uh, in terms of uh, uh, this thing here. Uh, it's slightly more complicated, but morally speaking, it's exactly this estimate. And these estimates, we do need um, to really kind of be able to overcome the problem that we still need to define products. So we need the, uh, the regularity uh, that's encoded in these estimates. So on the one hand, we need it conceptually because that helps us in defining this map. But then also we need it really in a kind of in a quantitative way in order to get the estimates. And here I just gave you the qualitative part to, uh, to make the structure appear. So I don't, does that give a bit more of an answer? More questions? Yes? Uh, so following up on that one, uh, can we maybe rewrite the equation um, the second one where you have the actual group and then the using the uh, device zero? Using the? Uh, here, you mean? Yes. So you maybe can just rewrite it in terms of zero. That's, that's, uh, that's correct. So here I would have to write uh, an inverse. <coughs> yeah, so it's a, now it looks a little bit like, what is this called? Uh, in differential geometry, there is a name for these types of derivatives. No, I forgot it. Yes, you're right. I could write, but that doesn't make it easier. And it takes away some of the intuition. So, I mean, you're completely right because I, you know, I said these objects really are a group. So, you know, in particular, they're invertible. I could rewrite it like this. But then, um, then this, uh, this object is, is, uh, is a bit more complicated to handle. And also it takes away some of the intuition, namely that uh, this is a little bit like a Taylor expansion, and if the pies just did contain the monomials, it would be a Taylor expansion in the base point x, around the point x, right? Because uh, remember that, uh, that the pi x uh, did contain uh, the plane uh, space-time Taylor monomials, which you would expect to be here in a classical Taylor approximation. So, so writing it like this is closer to the idea of uh, generalizing a Taylor approximation. But uh, of course, algebraically, you're completely right. I could write it as I raise, but uh, it doesn't seem to be very helpful to write it like this. Yes? I have another question. Uh, so here we say partial derivative of something uh, is zero. Yes. But then in the proof, you use that uh, this thing itself is zero. Okay. Yeah, which is much less, right? I mean, here. I'm just using it, uh, so, so I'm using this condition in its full glory to argue that this object is uniquely determined. But then in order to go from here to here, I'm just using a little part of it, namely for the 
multi trivial multi-index, which of course is contained. Yeah. So here it's really, you know, it's, uh, it's up to two. More questions? Yes? Yes, so, so in fact, part of, part of our task in the actual proof is also to estimate these things. And uh, so that's part of our, you know, I mean, in the end, uh, the proof is, uh, has many layers and there is an induction. And part of the induction, and perhaps I have time to write it down next time, involves an estimate of this object. So this object is, it doesn't diverge. So in the end, the, the philosophy is that, again, there is just this single... In all what I wrote down, there is just a single object which diverges, but that's very low dimensional. Uh, that's just a, a bunch of finite numbers because we had this population condition. Uh, that, uh, so it's really just a bunch of finite numbers that diverge, and the philosophy is to do an analysis kind of avoiding, you know, completely around these finitely, finitely many numbers that diverge and to just work with good objects, and this is a good object. It has nice algebraic properties, which I you know, wrote down at some point, and, but it's also analytically nice in the sense that it's uniformly bounded, even if you let your regularization parameter go to zero, as opposed to these objects. More questions? Yes, so, so, so that's, that's what I, so it's a little bit, you know, a little bit, you know, often this type of approach is related to what's called the renormalization group, that uh, um, there are certain finitely, there is, an, you know, there is a finite dimensional unstable part of your problem, and, uh, uh, and there is an infinite, in, infinite dimensional stable part of the problem. And here we're working on the stable part of the problem. So therefore, I also mentioned Lyapunov Schmidt or so because you're reducing uh, you're reducing the problem to uh, the low co-dimensional part, which is well behaved in this limit. And you're factoring out. You're completely disregarding the finite dimensional part that's diverging. And that's the task of the analysis to kind of really isolate these two things. And that's where the Malyavan derivative is exactly the right conceptual tool because it separates expectations from fluctuations and the problem is in the, uh, the, problem is in the expectations. I think now is time over. <laughs>